Well, hello everyone. Uh, I needed to make a video or two um, lecture, video lecture on our material for this chapter on uh, buying and disposing. Uh, it covers a lot of things. I'm only going to hold you to a handful of concepts out of this chapter, but I think uh, you'll find it uh, intriguing to say the least. So let's go ahead and get started. For the most part, we talk about from this chapter the, like I said, buying and disposing. And, and what we're talking about here is really the following. We as uh, consumers can really be influenced into buying or not buying, okay, um, based a lot on what is going on around us. These are what we call situational effects, okay. What is happening around us that can influence us into buying something or not buying something? And I want to go through these. There's a handful of these I want to cover. Uh, let me summarize them for you here to start with, and then we'll go through them detail by detail and go from there. Okay? So the first thing that we talk about is what is called uh, the consumption situation. And what this basically refers to is uh, the people that are around us, uh, as well as the location. Are we shopping online? Are we shopping at a store uh, in a physical locale? Uh, later we'll talk about some of the elements of, of store theatrics and so on and so forth versus uh, you know the people that are around us when we buy things. So we'll talk about the situation. That's one thing, one situation that affects our, our behavior. We also talk about time. And anything dealing with time, temporal factors, how they influence us in terms of uh, making a purchase, uh, if a product is about saving time, uh, is a big factor. We're also going to talk about what are called antecedent states. Another way of putting this is a consumer's frame of mind, okay? And we're going to talk about that in some detail, as well as why we shop, our shopping motives. So let's go ahead and uh, our motivation, our, our reasons for shopping. So let's go ahead and start going through each of these one at a time. The first one I want to mention here is the situation. Okay, The consumption situation refers to, uh, really includes uh, those people who may be physically with us when we are shopping, when we are considering to make a purchase. All right? Uh, this is... Uh, when we're at stores, we could be at Walmart, we could be at uh, Best Buy, we could be at some other, we could be at the shopping mall, possibly, and even online. Studies find that uh, the people around us when we're, we're shopping online uh, via the internet or through our smartphone can have an influence as well. They can actually influence us into buying things, and obviously they can influence us into not buying things. Um, you hold something up at a store, you know, what do you think? And someone looks at you, ah, I don't like that, okay? And wh while you do, uh, you know, maybe you decide not to get it then because someone has had that impact upon you. Or you show somebody something on your smartphone and say, you know, I'm thinking of getting this, what do you think? Oh, I wouldn't get that, you know? And, and so they can influence us into buying things. They can influence us into not buying things. This is a lot of, of conformity right here. This is conformity. Uh, conformity is matching our behaviors to that of others. They don't demand it of us, but we tend to give in to that. All right? Know this. <clears throat> Studies find that the lack of others, other people with us, can cause us to buy. Because sometimes we buy things because we don't have the influence of others around us. No one's impacting upon us. So uh, there's no pressure to not purchase from others. They're not present at the time. So you turn around and get it, and vice versa, all right? Um, the lack of others may cause you not to buy something because you don't know what people think. You don't know if they're going to like it, so I'm not going to buy it right now. So that's a lot of what I mean by the situation. Who are the people around you? What do they say? Uh, how do they act? That has, a, that has a very powerful influence. It really, truly does. We also speak of what are called temporal uh, factors and these are very important to us. Okay, a lot of products are sold with the idea that if you buy this product, it'll save you time. Very, very important to us. Okay, uh, we like things that will save us time, make our lives easier, and, and that. Uh, cell phones. 
the idea that we can contact someone immediately, okay, by text, by Snapchat, by Instagram, by phone calls and stuff like that, uh, we don't have to wait till another time, another place. We can do it instantly. Um, food orders uh, via your, your smartphone or, or by the Internet. You know, uh, it's funny. Most, the vast majority of millennials uh, make a lot of their purchases uh, by their smartphone. They, they don't turn around and pick up a phone at home to make the call. They don't even use the phone element uh, on their uh, smartphones to call and uh, place an order. They just turn around and place by phone and stuff like that. And, and a lot of companies have made that very easy for us to do. Uh, that has an impact upon us, all right? We can, we can place orders faster. It saves us time. Microwaves. Microwaves are a way of taking a, a particular food or a dish, and instead of putting it in the oven, instead of boiling it, instead of waiting for the stove to heat up, you can put it in a microwave, and it can be ready in 60 seconds or 90 seconds, as opposed to 10 minutes and things of that sort. Even fast customer service can influence us, okay? Companies that turn around and offer us, you know, quick returns, quick responses, uh, fast customer service has an impact. A lot of times you see those uh, uh, pop-up windows, you know, do you have any questions? And you're, you're in a chat room with someone if you choose to go. I mean, many times customers just close those windows, but a lot of times they have questions and they'll, and they'll turn around and respond. The Domino's Tracker is an example of this, okay? It, it tells you how your product is progressing. You, you purchase a pizza and, you know, has it been made? Is it en route? Has it made it to your door? I mean, that's the use of technology. They can tell you, you know, basically uh, where you stand on this. We, temporal factors are a very important thing, very important to say the least. And one of the reasons they are so important is because we as a people – seem to believe that we have less time than ever before. This is what we call time poverty, okay? This is what we call time poverty. Um, the fact of the matter is this isn't necessarily true. A lot of people want to get things um, as fast as they possibly can, okay? But in reality, uh, you ask, they've done surveys where they've asked people, okay, if you can get something faster, by ordering it in advance and picking it up through the drive-thru, um, what are you doing with all your extra time? And a lot of people who were surveyed said, well, I don't know. You know, you just have to get it fast. Um, the idea of turning around and going out to a restaurant and waiting to get seated, and that can be anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes or longer, and then getting seated, and uh, then waiting to get your water and, and a menu, and then waiting another five or ten minutes after getting your water or menu, waiting another ten minutes to give your order, and then waiting possibly 30 minutes to get your food. I mean, you, you could easily be talking an hour, hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half before you finally get fed. A lot of the younger generation, that's time poverty. You're taking away too much time. But if you ask them, what are you going to do with all that extra time? They don't know. You know, and, and I'm not trying to I'm not trying to attack or embarrass, but it's fascinating how our culture has uh, responded to that. So, what do we do to fix this? There's a thing called polychronicity, and polychronicity basically means uh, multitasking, trying to do more than one thing at a time. And what's interesting is I show the picture there of the person who's driving down the road and eating at the same time. Uh, you know, at home, you want automation so you could do your laundry and your dishes at the same time. Um, Americans do this frequently. They really, truly do. They do this a lot. Uh, this whole premise and this whole idea of, of multitasking. What's fascinating about multitasking is this. In the studies that have been done, of consumers to see if they accomplish more things by multitasking. There is, first of all, a sensation that you are doing better by multitasking, but in reality, you're less efficient. So you may feel like you're getting more done, 
but you're not necessarily doing the best. When, when students have their, their phones open and they are looking at their phones and taking notes at the same time, um, they take poor notes. <laughs> Studies have found that. But we really were very, very big on this. This seems to mean an awful lot to us. And yet, in reality, we're not necessarily uh, good at this. So we feel time impoverished when, in reality, we're not necessarily so. There are different types of temporal factors. For example, there is what is called psychological time. Psychological time is sort of this perception that too much time is lost waiting. Okay, and there are so many examples of this that we can talk about. One of the big ones is drive throughs You know, uh, I, I mentioned the idea of going out for a nice dinner and it taking almost 75 to 90 minutes before you get your food from start to finish. Uh, you know, a lot of people, that's way too much time that's lost. Well, now, you know, a drive through was supposed to fix that. Well, then people got to the point that they felt the drive through was, was too slow and they needed to go even faster there. So, you know, what do they do in a lot of drive throughs It's sort of fascinating. They actually um, put up a menu before you get to the point that you can order your food. That's, that's actually one of their solutions to do that. So you can see the food in advance, the menu in advance, and then when you drive up to the window or up to the speaker, then you know what you want to order. That's one way to uh, you know try to make you feel like you're not losing a lot of time. Another thing that drive throughs have done to try and fix this uh, feeling is, is that basically they create a, a, a window to order from, okay? Uh, and then they create a second one to pay at, and then they create a third location to pick up your food. So you feel the sensation of you're making progress. You're making progress. Um, and there is a little bit of truth that it does save you time if one window's sole job is to, to take the money and so on and so forth. But this step-by-step -step process often takes a consumer's mind off the weight at a single window. And, and, and it, it is very, very true in that regard. Okay. Some other things, if you live in the big city and you work at a job that requires you to uh, uh, go up and down elevators, some people get very, very tired waiting on the elevator. Uh, I bet you probably know instances where you press the button waiting, button waiting for the elevator. So after a few moments, what do you do? Yeah, that's right. You press it again because you know that if you press it a second time or a third time, it tells the elevator that it needs to go faster which in reality it doesn't necessarily do. What's interesting about this concept of slow elevators, the way to get around this, this loss of time, okay, that you're wasting time waiting for an elevator, you can't make elevators necessarily go any faster, especially in high rises, because by God, if they go up and down any faster, you could physically come off the ground or get pinned to the bottom of the elevator if it's going up too fast or coming down too fast. So what do they do? They put in mirrors. A lot of elevators near the uh, elevator, <clears throat> excuse me, they put in a mirror. Uh, they put in information. They try to take your mind off the fact that you're waiting. Okay? And that's something that they have tried to do before. Uh, for those of you that may someday do a lot of traveling with your job, uh, some people say they wouldn't want to do that. Some people don't mind. Um, airport baggage. Okay, airport baggage is sort of interesting because if you get off the plane and then you have to go to where the baggage claim is, you can see times where people are just standing around waiting for their luggage to appear. And pretty much everyone feels once the luggage comes through that their luggage is the last one to show up and, and so on. And may or may not be true. How do they fix this? Well, you can only go so fast and be so efficient at getting uh, uh, luggage baggage off the plane so they actually create situations where you have a long walk to get from the plane to the baggage terminal. This is a way to keep flyers from waiting uh, long periods for the luggage to arrive. Okay, You give them a moderate distance to go to pick up their luggage. And this actually gives airlines a chance to unload and get it to the carousel and things like that. So these are ways of getting around this concept of, of psychological time. Then we speak of what are called antecedent states also known as a consumer's state of mind. Um, a consumer's mood, all right, person's mood or, you know, physiological state at the time of purchase 
can have an impact upon a lot of things. That's what I mean by state of mind, okay? Uh, your state of mind, uh, your mood, how you feel at that moment can influence what you buy and what you think of a product, okay? If something's bought or not, and if the product is bought or not. I, I've seen customers turn around and find themselves in situations where uh, they need to purchase something, uh, they don't like waiting, they feel time impoverished, and so they walk out, when in reality they need that product. And maybe they'll rationalize that they don't need it, uh, or they'll go get it somewhere else, you know, and wait longer the next time at the different location. They just don't admit they were over at the other place and got upset. Um, but your state of mind can have an influence on this. For example, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but, you know, go, go grocery shopping. Never go grocery shopping on an empty stomach. Studies have actually found that people who go shopping for groceries on an empty stomach when they're hungry buy more than when they are full or not hungry. So, I mean, that really um, has something to say about it. Uh, your state of mind, your mood that you're in, can have a, a profound influence. Now, some important characteristics uh, to keep in mind um, about buying things. One is your level of arousal. Arousal refers to how stimulating an experience is, the, the, the purchasing situation and so on and so forth. Um, you see this a lot more when you are purchasing things uh, at a store. And we'll talk a little bit later about store atmospherics and things like that. Um, but basically, you don't see it as much online, but basically how they can get you uh, interested and attracted and, and things like that. Best Buy is a wonderful example to me because you go into Best Buy, they've got the yellows and the blues. Uh, you hear the, the bass of the music thumping in the back. It's very bright. It's very cheery. Uh, typically, that is more arousing than a store that's dark and gray and, and, and things of that sort. So it really does make a difference in that regard. And then secondly is, is pleasure. How enjoyable is the experience, okay, of making a purchase? Companies, let me tell you, will do what they can to influence these aspects, okay? Um, whatever they can. If, to make your purchasing uh, experience uh, pleasurable and to get your attention, arousal. Because strong arousal, and a pleasurable experience equal a high chance of making a purchase. It's not on the slide, but it really says a lot. Okay? Uh, strong arousal and pleasure really say a lot on having an impact upon this. And it, and it truly, truly does. Okay? Strong arousal plus pleasure equals high purchase probability. There you go. All right, that's enough for now. Uh, in another video, I'll turn around and explain some of the, the ways that we go about doing this, uh, trying to make the experience better, uh, make things more enjoyable, go from there. All right, keep up the great work.